Look at this idiot. One ball and no brains. He can't even put a man's armour on him properly. You're too fat for your armour. Fat? Fat, is it? Is that how you speak to your king? <laughs> oh, it's funny, is it? Hey there, folks. Mike for CMCC Builds here, and it's good to be back after a little bit of a recharge with the fam. Recently, the topic of heavy armor made the rounds on the forums. The subject resulted in a heated debate that I found interesting, so today I want to dive into the question of heavy armor and whether the strength and or proficiency to wear it is worth the investment. We of course can't answer that question without a thorough look at both light and medium armor, so we'll discuss that too. But before we jump into those topics, a quick reminder that if you want to get some cool perks like the character sheets of my builds or voting options for my upcoming videos, then please consider joining my Patreon. And of course, like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, first things first, let's get the obvious out of the way. The facts that you can discern from looking at the armor chart in the player's handbook. Heavy armor includes the armor type with the highest AC, plate, which gives an armor class of 18. This is one AC higher than the next best heavy armor, the highest AC medium armor can provide with max allotted dexterity, and the highest AC light armor can provide with max dexterity. This single point of AC comes at a cost, literally. It's twice as expensive as half plate, the next most expensive armor. The 1500 gold piece cost can be legitimately difficult to acquire depending on campaign and DM, but generally at some point in tier two, gold begins to pile up so the cost isn't entirely prohibitive. Plate also has the highest strength requirement with a 15 along with splint, the far cheaper heavy armor option. All heavy armor gives disadvantage on stealth checks and weighs as much or more than every other armor in the game. If your game doesn't use encumbrance rules, then this is one negative you can ignore. So that's the video, right? If you have the money, strength, proficiency, and don't care about stealth, then 18 armor class is better than a 17. What more is there? Well, plenty more in fact. Some tied directly into the negatives listed, which themselves are both negative and positive, and still others even more indirectly tied to the choices needed to wear either light, medium, or heavy armor. Before getting any deeper, we need to know what happens if you decide to wear armor. You don't have either proficiency or strength to wear. Any character can put on any armor. There isn't some magnetic repulsion that prevents breastplate from sliding over your character's head. What you do get is disadvantage on any ability check, saving throw, or attack roll that involves strength or dexterity. And you can't cast spells. That's a stiff penalty, so proficiency in armor you're wearing is almost mandatory. The strength requirement isn't quite as clear cut. If a character doesn't meet this requirement, their movement speed is reduced by 10. That's often, but not always, a 33% reduction to 20 feet of movement. The primary exception to this rule is the dwarf, whose speed will not be reduced by wearing heavy armor, no matter their strength. Given the dwarf's movement speed of 25, this just means that they receive half the penalty for wearing heavy armor without meeting the strength requirement. But what is the actual impact of that movement speed reduction? There isn't a single answer anyone can give to this question. It depends on build, party composition, battle map, DM playstyle, etc. The catch is that most, but not all, heavy armor users will be engaged in some form of melee. Whether it's a classic sword and board, or two-handed brute, or even some versions of spellcasters that want to be in the mix, like clerics with spirit guardians. And if you want to be in melee, you often need movement to get to enemies. The longbow user with sharpshooter can stand on one end of the map and pick off enemies without moving a step. The greatsword swinging paladin needs to get in the face of enemies to smite them and has to have enough movement to get to another if the first one falls down. There is no reason for you to expect enemies to just run up to you, basically handing you what you want on a silver platter, their head. Smart enemies will kite or focus on squishier and often more dangerous targets like unarmored spellcasters in the back ranks. So movement is important, especially to a melee combatant, but what if we do invest in strength? What benefits come along with that decision? The hard truth is not many. I don't know what Wizards of the Coast has against strength as a stat or concept. I don't know if they look at weapon damage dice and think that's a significant factor in overall damage output and as a result, the overall effectiveness of character builds. Whatever the reason, strength is bad. It is potentially the least impactful stat, with the exception of perhaps intelligence. And it looks like it's only getting worse with one D&D. Wizards, please fix this, please. I love strength, I love intelligence. I value both in my character concepts. I value them in life. Dexterity and wisdom are wonderful abilities, but there is no reason they should so thoroughly outpace strength and intelligence in terms of usefulness in the game. An investment in strength brings the possibility of utilizing a grappling build, along with access to pole arms and subsequently the pole arm master feat. Strength in a medium size allows for heavy weapons to be used, which also means the great weapon master feat is an option. 
If you're going to play a melee combatant, being able to control your enemy's movement via grappling, extend your reach with two-handed polearms, gain a bonus action attack through the polearm master feat, and bump your damage with the negative 5 plus 10 feature of the great weapon master feat is a primary route of optimization. All of that with the addition of the plus one to armor class would make this seem like an easy question to answer, but we have yet to discuss what is lost by going the strength route and what is gained with a medium or light armor dexterity build. Let's look a little closer at the plus one armor class. It's important to note that heavy armor is worth that plus one as a ceiling. Quite often it's worth plus zero. At level one, characters might have access to 50 gold piece scale mail for a medium armor that provides a 16 AC with only a 14 investment in dexterity. The level one heavy armor user might have access to 75 gold piece chain mail, which provides the same 16 in AC with only a 13 strength investment. But any additional increases in AC for the heavy armor user require a two point strength bump while the medium armor wearer can stick with a 14 and get max value from the armor they wear. Regarding light armor, there is a huge gap between that and medium armor unless the build is dexterity focused, primarily. So any build that isn't planning on maxing out dex or getting close to it would benefit greatly from medium armor proficiency, specifically those options that bring with it proficiency with shields. This is an important distinction because there are some subclasses that provide medium armor proficiency without proficiency in shields. The Bard College of Swords being a perfect example of this. With that 14 investment in dexterity, a character can go from a light armor 14 AC to a 19 AC by gaining proficiency with medium armor and shields. That's a massive 36% increase to AC, while the next jump from medium to heavy armor only procures a 5% increase. It's for this reason, as a bit of an aside, that the moderately armored feat, which gives proficiency in medium armor and shields, is vastly superior to the heavily armored feat. On the topic of feats, the two additional armor feats, medium armor and heavy armor master, are both situationally good feats. Neither is amazing, but heavy armor master is a half feat that provides a damage reduction that is very strong in tier one, and progressively less so as you move past that stage of the game. Medium Armor Master, on the other hand, is not a half feat, which is a big strike against it, but it provides two much better features, what amounts to a plus one AC to the medium armor wearer, functionally eliminating the delta between medium and heavy armor, and the removal of disadvantage to stealth checks while wearing medium armor. Which leads us to our next topic, stealth and other dexterity-based skills. Arguably the biggest factor in the heavy armor debate is the effect of dexterity and strength on gameplay. Focusing on strength quite often means you're dumping or minimally investing in dexterity. That means unless pass without a trace is involved, the strength based build won't be using stealth. And losing out on surprise means a massive dip in DPR and damage prevented because of that free damage. Even with pass without a trace, disadvantage on a negative modifier in stealth means that despite the plus 10 to your roll, a successful stealth check against an enemy's perception is not a guarantee. Now I understand that the rules of stealth, hiding, and surprise are fuzzy and different people have varying takes on the subjects, the details of which are outside of the scope of this video. One skill check that isn't fuzzy though is initiative. Again, a dexterity check, which means the strength build that dump dexterity will often lose initiative to team monster, and we know how bad that can be. If you're unsure, check out my video here. And tying them all together, if that strength build overcomes disadvantage and the negative dex mod on strength and manages to win surprise, there is still a decent chance they will lose initiative, greatly reducing the positive effect of gaining that surprise. Losing initiative in a surprise round is no different than winning initiative in a normal round of combat. Still quite good, but not nearly as good as it could have been. Now what sometimes happens in these scenarios is that the noisy, clunky plate wearer stays behind as the sneaky assassin types dart ahead and get in a round or two of combat via surprise before the plate wearer catches up and joins the scrum. Don't you know you never split the party? Clerics in the back, keep those fighters hailing hardy. In that situation, the dip to actual damage output is quite substantial, and because they're almost certainly a melee combatant, they can't just stay out of visual range and pepper enemies from distance as a counter to poor stealth. Which brings us to our next issue, range versus melee combat. A strength focused build will almost always miss out on decent ranged options, and the standard ranged optimization route of archery fighting style, crossbow expert, and sharpshooter surpasses the similar melee route of Pam plus Great Weapon Master in almost every way. The ranged combatant can out damage the melee combatant via the plus two archery fighting style, despite the lower damage dice. The increased rate of landing attacks along with the ability to switch targets with less reliance on movement more than makes up for that difference. The defensive advantages to a ranged playstyle by not having to engage enemies, avoid melee attacks, and kite enemies are nearly insurmountable to the melee character that has to dive into the mix and eat most of the enemy's attacks. And as we saw previously, any boost to AC will be small enough that the difference won't do much to close the gap. 
And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the Dexterity build has the option to take Elf as a racial selection, which opens the possibility of Elven accuracy as a feat choice. The damage bump on builds that take advantage, pun intended, of rolling triple dice is tough to match on a two-handed strength build that has almost no options to increase their hit chance beyond magic items. And this one does go to the strength user, who has the option to use whatever melee weapon they want, from the 2d6 greatsword all the way down to the 1d4 dagger. The dex user maxes out with the 1d8 rapier, and when acquiring magic items, that array of options does matter. The dex user finds a magic longsword, oh, tough. The strength user finds a fantastic magic rapier, score. It might not fit your aesthetic, but it just might increase your power level. Well, that's the video. Time for a drink. There are plenty of points that I've either glossed over or didn't include at all. Have other ideas, additional thoughts? Let me know in the comments below, let's talk about it. If you liked the video, please like the video. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I'll see you here next time.